Good evening, all. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is uh, District 2 uh, meeting. And uh, along with it, we're going to have a kind of a hybrid type of uh, situation where we're going to talk about the Johnny L. Tigner uh, public workshop. But before we get started, just a few days ago, so many Americans suffered a devastating challenge with this hurricane. People, lives have been altered forever. One of the news report that I saw a woman crying saying we have nothing left. That is so disheartening, so sad. And we must remember that because for just a few degrees here or there, it could have turned and it could be you. So please join me in saying a prayer for them, New Orleans and all that they've suffered. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, Lord, and we ask that your grace, your mercy, your kindness be shown to those who are suffering now in New Orleans. Whatever life expectancy that there is, let there be more. We call on you because that's all that we can do. And Lord, our heart goes out to them. Give us guidance and give us direction that any way that we can help those that are suffering now. Let us not be arrogant and selfish because it did not come our way. May we remain humble. And we thank you for this time together tonight, Lord, and whatever this meeting revealed, may it be done in a way, Lord, that gives glory to you. And we pray this now in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, it's a little challenging to go about normal business when those kinds of things have happened. I, number one, want to thank all of you for coming and uh, being a part of this so important that you come and it's so important that you uh, are part of this um, as we go through it before we get started with the program i just want to just tell you that uh, we have been doing a lot of uh, uh, initiatives in the city uh, some of you have called me about the the lights that you see out uh, that was a part of the initiative of our city uh, to really brighten up uh, our area. Uh, you've seen a lot of it in District 2. And uh, you notice that those are the LED. And here's why I wanted that to be done. Because so many people said to me that it was so dark and people are walking and it was kind of intimidating. And now uh, we're getting compliments on that. Um, I'd like to also uh, thank once again and invite all of the city to participate in, in, in any of the things that we're doing. We just got past uh, Juneteenth, um, which um, it was an initiative of myself and my commissioners, my colleagues uh, to uh, make that an official uh, city holiday. And uh, it has been, um, a very successful thing. I want to just tell you that you have a commission that is listening to your challenges and your concerns, and we act on them. Um, right now, I would like to introduce uh, two of my colleagues uh, in the front row here, District 1 Commissioner, Michael Hudak. And in the back, 
trying to hide. I'm not going to let him hide. <laughs> okay. We won't let you hide. Is Commissioner of District 4, Commissioner Todd Drosky. Now, when you see him on the dais, he's never that shy. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is uh, there are some flyers on the back, and it's this is what they look like. I would encourage you to take one, and this is actually to to give you all of the ways that you can stay connected with the city. Okay, this these are it's listed on here. Uh, how do you do it? And um, so, if you have a challenge with something, there are ways to go to the you know to our website. Uh, this is the information that you're looking for, and you will find it. But take one of these flyers, and it will let you know of all the ways that uh, you can do that. The next thing I want to talk to you about uh, is is this. Um, there are some initiatives in the city um, uh, that have to do with mental health and career opportunities for our kids. And uh, this is the flyer. And some of those are over on the table as well. So feel free to get, take one of those uh, flyers and really look into exactly what this is. Uh, tonight, I'm going to uh, talk about mental health a little bit. It's so important. Uh, we've had multiple tragedies right here in the city of Deerfield Beach where we've lost people. And uh, it's important that we stay connected with that. Mental health is so important. And so uh, after uh, one of our children was lost, um, I got to know her parents. I got to know Mr. Madden. Uh, I can have uh, just the last Okay. I've been told for the people on Zoom that I have to use the mic. I like walking because I'm part preacher. So I would like to ask uh, Michael, uh, stand up, please, Michael. Uh, this is Michael Marion and his wife. And they are very special people. Michael, come on up. I want you to just, just, just uh, wait them to just talk briefly and let you know what they got going on as far as mental health is concerned. A little while back, they lost their daughter. She was a very special person at Deerfield Beach High School. And, uh, you know, so there were some challenges there, but the things that he's doing now are just absolutely awesome. And I support them, Michael. Thanks. Hello, and thank you. This is my wife, Mary. Uh, as it was said, we were the parents, are the parents of Alexis Jane Marion. Alexis died by suicide on February 24th, actually 56 days after her good friend Bryce died on the same railroad track. She said a different time of the day. And since that time, together we've done and we are going to do everything humanly possible within our power to not let Alexis's death be in vain and to do all that we can to make the Deerfield community aware of the dangers, not only of depression and suicidal ideations, but of anxieties and the things that just come with being a kid in this time that in which we live. And there's not enough time in the day to go into all that I would like to say about it. One thing I would say, Alexis was a hell of a kid, outstanding kid. And until you were actually touched by suicide, you really don't know. And I can't begin. But what I will say, I've been in here 20 minutes now, maybe a little longer. And uh, one of the things that we learned in the United States one person dies by suicide every 11 minutes. So just in the short time that we've been sitting here, someone has died by suicide. And we need to do all that we can to stop that. 
would you like to say anything? This is my wife, as I said. I just wanted to add that a lot of things work in Deerfield. A lot of things work, a lot of things worked for my daughter. She um, went to great schools. She went to Quiet Waters, Deerfield Middle, Deerfield High. Um, she was active in Parks and Rec. She participated in all kinds of things, the lifeguard camp, drama camp, all kinds of things. She was a volunteer at the Butler House. She was a docent. A lot of things work in Deerfield Beach. What, what the BSO, I just told the captain, BSO did a better job helping when my child was in crisis than the mental health people did. That's not really right, because that's not really what BSO is supposed to do. And what we want to do is bring awareness to the fact that when you do need help from mental health counselors, that they show up. They need to show up. The people at the drama camp and the and swimming lessons, they showed up. The teachers at the schools showed up. The community showed up. It's the mental health part, the piece that seems to be missing. So if we can improve that, then we've done our job. And I brought this. This is something Suzanne Clark, who I didn't know, started. Um, it's called Kindness Rocks. And she's uh, the art teacher at Deerfield Elementary. And I didn't know her until Alexis died. So I'll pass it around. I just think it's cool. Um, she did a rock garden for Stoneman Douglas, and she did a rock garden for Bryce and Alexis. Thank you. And one last thing, September 11th at uh, Zion Lutheran Church on 10th Street, we're having our first annual city mental health fair. It's in honor of Alexis, and it's actually in honor of all of us. Because the thing is, when one person dies, Alexis is the one who ended her life that day. So many more of us are affected. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we need to stop it. We need to do what we can to make it stop. And thank you. Yes, thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you so much. Now, I showed you this flyer. Um, and this flyer uh, talks about uh, mental health. It's called the Chat and Chew Zoom. Um, it's going to be on Tuesday, September 7th. I'm going to have uh, Officer Joe Lamonaco come up for a second and address this. And, and, and let me just say, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, I've gotten a chance to meet some really, really special people with. Uh, BSO, I mean, we, we should be very happy with what we have here in the city. And this is one of our fine officers. This is a good man. He does a good job. I'm really proud of this man. Uh, so go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, so just to give you a, he basically hit it on the head on what we're going to be talking about. But uh, just to give you a brief overview of, of how this happened, it's called the Chat and Chew. This will be our second one. We've already done one. It's really for District 2. That's what we came up with this program. And how it came about was right here at a commission meeting. Uh, there was a wonderful woman who lives in the community named Aisha O'Neill. Maybe you guys know her. Yeah. She's the one who has a library right outside her house. Take a book, leave a book. Uh, just a wonderful woman who came up to us and said that she wanted to do something better for the community. And uh, we brainstormed and we came up with this event, Chat and Chew event. And we broke it into two parts. The first part is going to be a career option, a viable career option. So we have somebody come from either the fire department, tell what to take to be a firefighter. This time we're going to have someone come from, she is a store manager of a big retail chain and she has started her own clothing line. So she's going to talk to kids about being an entrepreneur, things that to really make something of themselves. And the second topic is mental health. And uh, Michael's gladly enough, gladly enough came out and said that he wants to speak. So he's going to tell his story about his daughter, things that he could have done different, things that he missed, things that he hopes that other people can, can really take something from it and, uh, and never let that happen again the best we could. So thank you guys so much. Please join in. It's on Zoom Tuesday, September 7th, 6.30 to 8. Please be there. Please, 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 please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, at this time, I'm gonna call up our uh, 
city manager because there's some people that I want him to introduce and and then we'll just flow on with the program. So if uh, um, just come on up. This is our city manager, Dave Santucci. Hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. This is a, is a good crowd, and I see that we got quite a few online, too, so that's, that's great to see. Um, this evening, we have some very special guests from Broward Health that um, have come here to talk to you about a couple of subjects, um, but, but also they're going to talk to you a little bit about uh, COVID-19. And I, I just want to say that from uh, the city of Deerfield Beach staff, um, we recently lost one of our team members and attended his funeral today. And so I cannot stress the importance enough about being safe and about being vaccinated when it comes to uh, this, this deadly virus, um, which is, is unfortunately fitting for this evening uh, and the guests that we have tonight. So uh, our representatives from Broward Health, uh, we have um, we have Dr. Aldo Cal Calvo. Calvo, thank you. And Dr. Calvo a, serves as a medical director of ambulatory services at Broward Health. In his current ro role, Calvo oversees patient care and quality for Broward Health Physician Group, Broward Health Community Health Services, and Broward Health Urgent Care, as well as the Accountable Care Organization and Managed Care Division. For over 20 years, Calvo has cared for patients at Clin Clinicas de las Americas. Did I say that very well with a, without a Spanish accent, I hope? Okay, great, perfect. Uh, which provides comprehensive and culturally, culturally competent primary care services through community health services to the Latin American community. Prior Calvo to being named medical director of ambulatory services, Calvo served as a, as a medical director of community health services. He earned his medical degree from Nova Southeastern University College of Osteopathic Medi Medicine and completed his residency in family medicine at Broward Health Medical Center. He has also served in as, a, as an assistant clinical professor of the Broward Health Nova Southeastern University Family Medicine Residency Program for the past 18 years. Calvo is, a, is certified by the American Osteopathic Board of Family Physicians and is a member of the American Osteopathic Association and the American Academy of Osteopathic Family Physicians. And hopefully me saying that word six times correctly. Uh, so without further ado, if I could have the representatives of Broward Health come up if they'd like to include uh, Dr. Calvo to speak. Uh, thank you very much and, and welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, whether you're here or online with Zoom. I'd like to thank first uh, uh, the Vice Mayor and David Santucci, City Manager, for this opportunity. I have some colleagues I'd like to pre present. Uh, first, we have Alice Taylor, our Chief Executive Officer for Broward Health North. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Foster, who's the Chief Medical Officer for Broward Health North as well, and Ashley Boxer, who also works in Government Affairs, External Affairs with Broward Health as well. Uh, we are here today uh, because we want to talk to you a little bit about Broward Health's efforts with COVID-19 pandemic, and then I'm going to also allow some of us to talk about things that we're doing individually for the community. Uh, our response in Broward Health has been, I would say, swift and, and robust when it comes to COVID-19. We were the first uh, healthcare organization to roll out testing uh, for COVID-19, what you probably already know as PCR testing, uh, at different sites in Broward County. Back in the beginning in March, we were the first uh, hospital system to do that in Broward County. Uh, we were also the first uh, hospital system in Broward County to offer vaccines to the public as well. Uh, so we're very grateful to have had that opportunity in partnership with other entities like the city of Fort Lauderdale and the Inter-Miami Football Stadium. We were very fortunate to provide over 100,000 vaccines collectively at that site and also within our hospitals as well at Broad Health North and Broad Health Medical Center. In addition to that, for anyone who's been COVID positive, who's had needed to, a special acute care, our hospitals uh, offer world-class service uh, by numerous wonderful physicians, the latest technologies, and most importantly, I think we can all agree, the human touch, a uh, compassionate care. And that's because of the great leadership of Alice Taylor, and of course, Dr. Foster, which I'm very happy that they're here today 
to join me on this. Uh, so just some statistics, I think you already know, but I'm gonna just go real briefly with this. In the state of Florida, currently as of the week of August 20th, 2021, the positivity rate, meaning that those who get tested for COVID, what is the likelihood that they're gonna get be positive is 16.8%. It's actually a little bit down from the previous week. The number of deaths uh, during that week were 389 in the state. New cases, unfortunately, are, are still up at 151,000 cases that are new of COVID-19 in the state of Florida. Vaccines, we've also seen an uptick in vaccines, fortunately for us, for many reasons we can discuss. Uh, we were up about 461,000 vaccines for that same time period. When it comes to Broward, uh, Broward County, the positivity rate is a little bit less at 12.9. Uh, we also uh, have vaccines that approximately in the state of Florida, 53% of all uh, Floridians are vaccinated. It's the same in Broward County. But unfortunately, the most alarming statistic that I'm going to share with you today, and if you remember anything today, is that within our hospital system, those that are admitted to the hospital due to COVID and those that are in our ICUs due to COVID, who unfortunately are now either receiving oxygen or intubated, and we're doing our best to keep them alive, not only for their lives, but also because of their families who suffer along with them, and we suffer with them too. The amount of people that, uh, that we have there, overwhelmingly 98% are unvaccinated, 98%. It's not a number that I like to share, uh, but it's something that's necessary to share with you because if you are vaccinated, wonderful, the vaccines are safe and effective, and they will prevent hospitalization and death. That's what they were created for, whether it's a uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, whether it's a Pfizer vaccine, whether it's a Moderna, you are protected. If you're unvaccinated, unfortunately, as I just said, you have the risk of not only being admitted, particularly if you have an underlying condition, such as hypertension, diabetes, if you're a cancer survivor, if you smoke, if you're overweight or obese, if you're pregnant, these are risk factors that will probably, if you're unvaccinated, if you get infected, you'll probably end up at a hospital where Dr. Foster and his team will probably try to help you as much as possible, but it can be prevented. That number, 98% of those who are admitted or are unvaccinated is something very frightening. And it's something within our reach, within our power to change. It's, take, it's about taking a vaccine. And I'm here to tell you that the vaccines, based on all the data from the clinical trials and what we've seen since then, there have been over 350 million doses provided in this country. The safety, the efficacy is well documented. And there really is uh, no fear that you should have in getting a vaccine. But I understand that there may be individuals here or in our Zoom presentation or in the community that may have questions and concerns. We're here to, to answer any questions that you may have. And if we don't answer them today, I really advise you to please reach out to your healthcare professionals. My oath is to take care of my community. That is why I'm medical director. That is my overarching responsibilities to take care of my community. I've been practicing in Broward County, as David just, uh, articulated for over 20 years actually. And I practice in a particular area where I take care of people who look like myself, people of color, people who've been devastated by this pandemic, people who are at increased risk because of certain underlying conditions, or maybe they haven't been vaccinated of ending up in the hospital. I don't wanna see that again. So if it's not with us, please reach out to your healthcare professionals and have those conversations because it's quite important to do that and get the right information, the correct information, instead of finding information that's wrong. There's a lot of information, unfortunately, is out there that is wrong. But that's in mind, I'm gonna pass over to Dr. Foster. Maybe you can tell us a little bit of what's going happening at your hospital and, and Alice as well, please. Hello, thank you for having me. Just like Dr. Calvo said, unfortunately, what we are seeing in the hospital is a conglomerate of people who are very, very sick. And the majority of them, overwhelming majority, 98, 99% are unvaccinated. And, you know, we're, as physicians, our job is to take care of whoever walks through the door. I've taken care of prisoners who've been handcuffed to the bed. 
I've taken care of patients who haven't listened to my advice for 20 years. We're not here to judge, but we want to help get the information out. We want to make sure that whatever you're basing your opinion on is an actual medical professional's opinion, not someone who was in their room tweeting or putting something on Facebook who heard from their uncle's friend that this vaccine is bad. This vaccine is very safe. All of us on this stage have gotten our doses. We're still here to tell our story. The main thing is, yes, you may catch COVID. My brother last week got COVID. He was vaccinated. He's already better and recovered. No side effects, no problem, because he was protected against serious illness. So we want to make sure that just like getting a cancer screening, getting a colonoscopy, we're trying to prevent a serious illness. The vaccine is safe. We're still here to take care of you in the hospital. We've certainly done our part to make sure that our hospital continues to run for our patients in our community that are non-COVID related, because it's not like the medical community stopped. We still have people coming in with heart attacks and strokes and needing care. We're still here for you, but this makes it a lot harder. So please, if you can convince one person to get vaccinated in your small circle of people, you protect yourself and you protect yourself and your friends and your family. So we're here to answer questions. I just urge that wherever you get your information from, you try to get it from an MD or a DO, a medical doctor who's able to answer those questions appropriately. All right, Ms. Taylor, I think you have some words to say as well. Yes, I do. Good evening. For those who don't know me, I'm Alice Taylor. I'm the CEO of Broward Health North, and I've actually been with the Broward Health System since 2003. I hail from Philadelphia, and I've been here almost 20 years, I guess. So um, I want to tell you some good news about the hospital. A lot of great things. We are your hospital in your neighborhood. We serve your community, and we're proud to do it. We're humbled to do it. Uh, we stood up our vaccination site and we um, vaccinated many of, of the people in our community and we had a great response from the community. I wanted to tell you that we just recently became a comprehensive certified stroke center. So that means that we deliver the best care in stroke. If you're having any kind of symptoms, we're there to take care of you. Um, we also are a level two trauma center. Unfortunately, we have, we have a lot of trauma in our community, but we're there to serve you. And um, I also wanted to talk about one of the most exciting things that has happened. This year, we started a residency program and two very important um, services. One is emergency medicine. We're training new doctors to be emergency medicine physician. And also we have a residency program for internal medicine doc doctors. So that just started on July 1st. There's an old joke in, in nursing and healthcare that you never wanna get sick on July 1st because you have the new medical students and the new residents coming, but believe me, they're well supervised. So don't worry, you can still come. And um, it's just exciting for us they will be members of our community. We are a primary site for them. Now, Broward Health has had a um, GME, a graduate medical education program for many years, but Broward Health North, this is our first year in the um, being a uh, accredited GME program. So we will continue and, and have different services. As you know, the literature uh, states that physicians um, Pretty soon in, in 10 years, we won't have enough physicians to go around. So it's really important for us to train them and keep them in our community. I know one of the initiatives that you're working on is affordable housing. We're very excited about that because that's gonna attract some of our residents to have that ability um, to be in an affordable housing. As you know, residents hardly make any money. Um, so they'll be happy to be part of our community. So that's um, anything else going on? Oh, we just recently got certified for our rehab center. We're uh, CARF certified, which is the gold house, the good housekeeping seal of approval. So we're real excited about that as well. Any questions? Get vaccinated. Yes, Terry. <laughs> Howard, first of all, thank you and your staff for coming out. I think I'm going to go over to Ashley. <laughs> okay. Ashley. I'm going to go back to my conversation with you in April. Education. Sure. On COVID in this community of Deerfield Beach. When are we going to get some? So 
Hi, everyone. Good, good evening. I'm Ashley Box. I'm the Vice President of External Affairs for the System for Broward Health. And thank you, Mr. Scott. Um, you've been one of our allies and advocates. So I appreciate everything you've done personally to help us. Um, we do have Dr. Calvo, who has volunteered his time to go out as well as um, our other physicians who have been speaking to the importance of COVID, protecting yourself, um, getting the vaccinations. And now, if, if unfortunately you do get sick, getting the monoclonal antibody infusions, um, if you know, you're know you within a certain criteria and within a certain frame of time, because we want to try and keep people out of the hospital as much as possible. So in terms of the availability of resources, we absolutely have that. Um, if there are any specific opportunities that you would like us to participate in, we can definitely arrange that, whether it's virtual or in-person. Um, in terms of anything further than that, um, do you want to be a little bit more specific? or A lot of my seniors, mm -hmm. as you know, Alice know, I live in a senior area. A lot of them don't have Zoom, so they can't do it. Mm -hmm. We need them in person to go there and talk to small groups at a time, to educate them on why they need this vaccination. We can do a little one-on-one, mm -hmm. -on -one. but when you come in, the great experts and talk to us, that can cover a whole lot. And I do believe that a lot of our seniors in the city, I'm, I'm proud to announce that Deerfield Beach Housing Authority, the Palms of Deerfield, I believe 85% of them was vaccinated back in March and April mm -hmm. because of the initiative that we had going. But we have some others yeah. that's not, and they need it badly, but they need education. And that's why I have to push this educational piece. Sure. As we course. talked about. And we want to get the word out there too. So um, maybe what we can do is, is follow up and try and set some series of those types of meetings. And we figure out which, which physician, because as you and I have discussed, getting a physician in front of them to talk about the efficacy and the safety is what's important. Thank you. So absolutely. And, and I want to take this opportunity to also thank the vice mayor for inviting us today, the city manager, Mr. Scott. It was a pleasure working with you um, on our vaccination pod just thank you for everything that the community has done for us and our caregivers to lift us up during this time. Um, our team has been, Alice has been in, in scrubs helping patients because I don't know if you know, but she is a registered nurse by trade. Um, so it's been a very challenging time um, for our team. We just had a, an appreciation week for our caregivers. And we just want to thank the community for, for always being there for us too. Yeah, sure. It's probably not for me. It's probably for one of the physicians, right? <laughs> oh, thank you. Healthy together. When you go out to Trade Winds Park to get the uh, COVID testing, he uh, Healthy Together sends you um, something to your email or text you, but you can't open it. So people are walking around sick because they don't know what the results are. Is there any other way of their phone number? Because it's hard as heck trying to get somebody to give you explanation of what your results are. Thank God some of us are more educated than others. But when we have people in our community per se that do not have access to a lot of, uh, they're not into the um, texting, they're not into Zoom or whatever. What number can you give us? Because I get calls all the time because our people are going, but when they can't get a results back, not knowing if they are sick or not. Could you please give us a number? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the Trade Winds Park site is run by the Florida Department of Health in Broward County. I'd be happy to follow up with them to get a contact number to express your concerns. I can give you my card after this, and I'm happy to follow up on your behalf. Very quickly, uh, Mr. Preston, 
uh, Alice or Dr. Calvo, uh, could you somebody please speak about the booster shot, where and when we'll be able to get it? Be before that's answered, uh, that question came uh, from our former commissioner. I'd like to recognize her, uh, former commissioner uh, Gloria Battle. Thank you for coming. Okay. Thank you for that question. Yes, if you are an individual who's deemed immunocompromised, if you are a person who's had transplant surgery, a kidney, a liver, uh, and are receiving medications to prevent rejection, you can get a booster today. If you are an individual who has cancer and also are receiving treatments to suppress your immune system with permission from your physician or oncologist, you can get a vaccine today. Uh, if you are uh, deemed the immunosuppressed by any other condition, such as if you have rheumatoid arthritis, you're taking powerful medications also to quiet your immune system, you can get a booster today. We know that based on the data that those individuals, despite receiving two doses, they didn't probably receive the same immune response as someone who didn't have those conditions. So we want them to be protected. So you can certainly go to any Publix, or, or anywhere that's offering the, the vaccine, CVS, Walgreens, wherever your local access of vaccines can you can get that. For the rest of us who have been vaccinated, uh, the CDC is currently now in the midst of rolling out a staggered approach and how we're doing this. But what I can tell you is that it's based on when you received your initial series. So if you received it like most of us who are in healthcare, which we received it earlier during the pandemic when vaccines were first available, most of us received our second dose in January. So count eight months later, the month of September is when we will start at some point, uh, there'll be vaccines for a third booster for us. And what that essentially will do is it will increase your immunity uh, tenfold. Uh, we've known, unfortunately, from the what you've probably heard, the Delta variant, the Delta strain, it's pretty nasty. Uh, this particular strain, and there've been multiple ones, and there's gonna probably be others to follow, uh, but this one has uh, really devastated our community much more than at any given time. And the vaccines, although effective in preventing hospitalization and death, this, the illness that you get, even when fully immunized, you're still getting those, side, those symptoms of fevers and, and just cough and so forth. So by getting a third or booster dose, it will help us protect against this variant and hopefully anything that comes thereafter. But the key point is, and ending this pandemic is we need to start, those who are not vaccinated need to get vaccinated. Even if you've been infected, you still need the vaccine because infection by, not, by immunity from an infection itself does not last as long and is not as robust as one with a vaccine. So please make sure you do that, okay? Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Yes, good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Sure can. All right. Uh, hello, Dr. Calvo. Hello there. How are you? It's nice to hear I'm from you. Doing well, thank you. Um, my question to you is concerning uh, the primary care community group that you know had usually meets at the at the hospital. Uh, will we be having a meeting there soon? Yes, and thank you for that question. And uh, what we've had and we've done over the past year, many years is have meetings with our community members to make sure that they understand what Broward Health is doing in helping provide good access to care, the quality care, and also talk about the services that we have. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, and in first it was because we didn't have vaccines, and then we had the rollout of vaccines, but it was staggered. We haven't been able to meet in person and we've done them by Zoom. And as you mentioned, it's Zoom is good for those of us who are able to access a computer or smartphone and have Wi-Fi or broadband. But as we know, that's not always the case for many of us. And we are very cognizant of that. And we look forward to the days when we're able to meet in person like we're doing today. And hopefully that will be soon. So to answer your question, I would foresee, I would see that hopefully when this surge is over, we can start talking about when the next meeting will be in person, but that is our aspiration to do it in person because we all know 
It's a lot easier when you can feel it, taste it, touch it, and smell it, right? Thank you for your question. Thank you. I hope everyone heard what the doctor said, and please take his advice. I, when I was putting together the agenda for tonight, I told the city manager that I wanted someone from Broward to come and, and, and be able to speak to us. You guys did a great job. And I think <clears throat> sometimes we forget the great job that our healthcare professionals do. It's not just treating, you know, there is the psychological effect to them as well of, of watching people suffer. And one of the reasons that I wanted them to come is that I have a friend right now at Northwest Regional in Margate on a ventilator fighting for her life. So please heed the advice uh, because she was not vaccinated. And, uh, and now it's, it's, it's really tough. So um, we're challenged in many ways with this thing. And I wanted someone uh, to come out and give us some direction. And uh, so thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to have the city manager. Oh, okay. Yeah. You have a question? Okay. How important it is to um, build your immune system. Mm -hmm. And there's all the evidence and the research studies from different um, California, the data is there. Even Dr. Fauci, he even admitted he's been doing uh, large doses of vitamin D3 and vitamin C and magnesium. Despite that, you know, you take the shot, it's still important that you build your immune system. And that's the thing that a lot of the um, providers we're not openly speaking about. Now I know in Broward Health, they dispense a lot of vitamin D3, correct doctor? Okay, yes, I know, cause I've been doing research. And it's been proven that the uh, individuals at the early part of the pandemic who actually died due to COVID-19, they had zero to no vitamin D level in their system. This research is all there, but what was interesting is Dr. Fauci, was taking vitamin D before there was a vaccine. And I do know that some people have taken the vaccine and have adverse effect, but what was not being driven home is that they must improve their immune system. Even though you got that vaccine, you must go to your doctor, make sure you're on a therapeutic dose of vitamin D, magnesium, zinc, and vitamin C, because these are the things that's going to build your immune system and decrease the chances of variance. Okay. They're not expressing that enough. And because I've done the research, there's a research out there. They're not educating the people that they need to build their immune system as well as eating healthy, healthy lifestyle, but everything that is to build your immune system is the key component or else they'll continue to have variants. And of course you have another vaccine, and so on and so forth. But that's the thing that really bothered me the most when I hear people talking about, oh, just get the shot. And say, oh, I have the shot. So don't have to worry about building the immune system. But vitamin D3 is one of the key components and you need magnesium in order to help the absorption. So as a doctor and a professional at Broward Health, you can also explain that to the audience. Yeah because I am in the medical field too as well. I would agree that vitamins and the ones that you mentioned are, are quite important. In addition though, to build your immune system, which you mentioned some of it, is exercising, maintaining normal weight, uh, sleeping you know, well, reducing your stress. If you are a smoker, if you drink more alcohol than is recommended, all those things need to be addressed in order to build your own immunity. I think what, what we deal with a pandemic like this and we talk about vaccinations, since this is unfortunately a novel coronavirus, right? This is started in 2019 and it's still progressing through our communities and still circulating out there and causing all this damage. The vice mayor just described one of his colleagues or friends at a hospital, you know, a vaccine helps in addition to everything else. So that's why I think what we want is we want our patients to be vaccinated, 
but we also want, and we have to teach because that's what providers are for, right? Nursing or physicians, we're educators, we teach. And this is why it was so important that the vice mayor and the city manager invited us today here so we can educate and respond to your questions. But thank you very much for your, for your response. We appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we're going to take one more question and then we're going to move on to uh, Pastor Bowles. He took the Pfizer uh, both shots and then he also went to take the booster, which is, is that two shots? Because uh, he, he is one, is it, he took two shots. He said he had to go in and take two shots in both arms because of the nastiness of the uh, the Delta. Uh, whoever he went to uh, was requiring him to take two shots of this booster shot. So is it one or is it two when the booster is being uh, uh, administered? Thank you. So the, the booster shot you're getting is the same shot you got before. One shot, same dose to boost your immune system to making new antibodies against the virus. It's right now, not a new formulation, not a change. Whether in six months, we'll have something different, we, we're just not sure. Science changes, viruses mutate based on how many people they go through. But right now, the booster is one shot. As Dr. Calvo said, if you're a, a regular member of the community without an immunocompromised state, eight months from the date of your last shot, which for most people will not be before September 20th when the CDC gives approval and rolls it out to your community. So you kind of want to count on a calendar from the last shot you got, eight months and go from there. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and we have a, um, some changes in the city, um, different positions, and I'm gonna have the city manager. Uh, thank you, doctor. Introduce those people now to you. Just And just before I do, if I could, uh, Dr. Calvo, Dr. Foster, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for everything that you're doing in the hospital uh, for our community. Greatly appreciate it. And Miss Alice Taylor, I just want to say that, um, you know, since I've known you and since you've been in this position, I, I can definitely see uh, a change in the relationship between the hospital and the community and your outreach and, and your focus on helping this community is fantastic. Greatly appreciate everything you do and the partnership we have. Thank you so much. And on to some, some, some other great news. And I'm, I'm very, very excited to be able to introduce a whole host of uh, new folks, not some not so new uh, to the city but in new roles. And so first, if I may, I would like to introduce Mr. Mark Wood. He is our code compliance manager. If you remember uh, Mr. Bernard Pita, Mr. Bernard Pita did so well here that uh, we lost him, uh, unfortunately, but we are in great hands with Mr. Mark Wood. We do um, need to um, move quickly through the program to get to the, um, to the Tigner Center presentation. So I could either uh, maybe have set them meet with uh, individuals at the end, if you'd like, or I could have them come up. It's- I would just like to introduce- uh, I, I will, of course, yeah. yep. I'll, I'll do this. Okay, great, we'll so we'll do that. So everybody I'm introducing right now will be available at the end of the meeting to, um, for you to introduce yourselves and for them to introduce themselves to you. Also, I'd like to introduce our new director of Parks and Recreation, Ms. Teresa Renard. She's there in the back. And our familiar face, but new Director of Environmental Services, Mrs. Ms. Priscilla Sejelnik. Last, but certainly not least, um, our new Chief of Police, Mr. Adam Hoston. Okay, with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to... Uh... Thank you. Thank you. Um... Right now, we're going to have uh, from Planning and Development, uh, Developmental Services, uh, Mr. Eric Power, Code Compliance. Uh, um, come on up. Just, yeah, let's just say a couple of words. Let everybody know who you are. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, hello, yeah, good evening. Uh, Eric Power, Director of Planning Development Services uh, for the City of Deerfield Beach. Um, actually, just as the as the managers mentioned, so um, Mark is our really our newest employee, and we're very happy to have him um, acting in our code compliance manager position. So um, really tonight, we're just going to um, just, I, I feel like you guys see this from me all the time. <laughs> Same things over and over again. Um, you remember the importance of obtaining a building permit if you're doing any type of work. It's the, the number one issue that we typically have um, is, you know, you have to make sure that you have someone who's safe, that's doing the work for you. If you get a, if you get someone to do work for you and they're not a legal contractor and something happens, right? You're the one responsible for that. That's that's the reality of that. So please, please make sure you're looking at that. We do have some code brochures in the back that have some basic information as far as uh, trash pickup and things of that nature. And again, I'll be here at the end of the meeting too if you guys have any specific questions or need to talk about anything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Absolutely. Uh, and just remember uh, that... Uh, Terry will be available. Uh, Chief uh, Hofstein will be available. Priscilla will be available if there's any questions at the end of the meeting. Now, what we're going to do now is transition into the workshop of the Johnny L. Tigner Center. And uh, with that, uh, we'll have uh, Priscilla give a presentation. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Priscilla Sigalnik, I'm the Director for Environmental Services. So it's my pleasure tonight to introduce our design build team. We're going to go through some slides to show the renderings and conceptual drawings for the Johnny L. Tigner Center. Um, this is our second workshop. We held a workshop a few months ago, brought it before the commission, uh, and the commission recommended that we come back and and hear from the community some more. So we're back out here today to hear from you uh, to ensure that we capture uh, the desires for this future Tigner Center, okay? So I'm gonna pull up our uh, presentation. Forgive me one second while I share my screen. And I'll ask our design build team to come forward. Just okay. Good evening. My name is Mike Boss. I own MBR Construction. I'm the contractor for Johnny Tigner. I have the easy job tonight. I'm just going to introduce the team and I'm going to let a boss talk a bit more about the design of your structure. So uh, I, I wrote my, my role is GC. A boss and Ellen are the design element of the team. And we've got civil engineering, which is Thompson Associate. We've got Calvin uh, Giordano for landscape architecture. Delta G does the electrical and the MEPs. And structural engineer is Saad El Haj. That is our team. So with that, I'm going to give it to a boss. I'm going to talk about the actual structure itself. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Um, appreciate you uh, attending the meeting. So um, what you're seeing right now is the existing conditions at the Tigner Center. Um, we have 175 parking spaces currently. Uh, you'll see the existing Tigner Center is about 6,700 square feet, and the existing gymnasium is 11,000 square feet. Uh, this is the proposed site plan. So um, the existing gymnasium would uh, remain, and then we would replace the uh, Tigner Center with a new two-story structure that's over uh, 20,000 square feet. And um, we will have 168 parking spaces and we're only required to have 117. So we have plenty of parking for the facility. The parking lot would be uh, completely redone, the landscaping, the lighting. Um, when we get done with this project, it would be a brand new facility. Um, there's a entry plaza that will uh, be welcoming you into the facility. Uh, there are, um, 
canopies that connect the two buildings. And then we also have a plaza uh, to the rear that goes off the banquet hall. Um, this was the program that was provided as part of the RFP. So this is a design build project. So it, it was done in a couple of different phases. Uh, there was RFQ where we were shortlisted and then an RFP where uh, we provided a design based on this program and then um, with a price. So a major component of this building are different uh, meeting spaces, banquet hall, meeting room, classrooms, and then also administrative spaces. Uh, there's a catering kitchen, and then of course, all kinds of support spaces. So um, as far as the programs um, in this facility, um, you can imagine you know, your typical city community center, it would have different after school programs, summer programs, uh, winter programs, uh, various classes, um, so there's a lot of activities and each of these are uh, based in the different rooms that are provided in this facility. So uh, this is the proposed uh, first floor plan. You would come in from the plaza from the drop off and there's a large entry plaza with a covered arcade. From that arcade, you go into the lobby, there is a welcome desk um, onto your right-hand side. And then as you move forward, there is a large uh, multi-purpose banquet hall. And then on your left-hand side are uh, meeting rooms, computer lab, as well as the catering kitchen and some of the support spaces. Um, on to the right side, you have the canopies that you can go out that door and you can go directly into the gymnasium. To the rear is the outdoor terrace. Um, this is the second floor, so you can come up the steps, the stairs, or you can come up the elevator. Um, there are staff offices, uh, mirror studio, camp room, multi-purpose room, classrooms, um, DJ uh, area, and lounge TV room. We also have within that, um, a center corridor that has seating for small gathering spaces. So if you're waiting for a class to start, you can hang out there and, and, and uh, it provides a nice social atmosphere. So as far as the design inspiration, when we were originally designing this building, um, you have this community center, you have another community center in the facility, in, in the city, and we looked at those community centers as inspiration. We also looked at the Pioneer uh, Grove design standards as far as um, looking at, you know, what would be the theme for the building. So the, the building uh, as proposed has a lot of strong geometric massing. It's hurricane resistant concrete tilt wall construction, concrete floors, concrete roof. It has a full emergency generator uh, building is not designed as a shelter, but it will be used as a distribution center after the storm event. Um, very easy to maintain, large overhang in the front, a lot of rich detailing with columns and uh, brick columns and steel canopies, wood um, um, detailing. We have vertical elements for visual movement and then canopies, as I mentioned, connecting the two buildings together. So um, we looked at the two community centers that you have on the left-hand side. And then um, originally the, uh, you'll see the proposed design on the right-hand side. So that's what we uh, submitted to the city and that's what we won the project on. And then after we met with the city after the selection, um, they encouraged us to look at um, incorporating more of the Pioneer Grove standards. And on the left-hand side, you see some of the inspiration for the Pioneer Grove standards. And then on the right-hand side is the updated design incorporating those Pioneer Grove standards. So you see um, the brick columns, the canopy with the wood, the metal. Um, so it, it's, you know, we certainly think it's an improvement in the design and, um, we had a previous public meeting 
and the consensus was that you know certainly they they preferred the pioneer grove standard design uh here's some of the exterior views of the original design on top and the pioneer grove design on the bottom same thing here original design on the top pioneer grove on the bottom same here Um, these are some of the views on the interior. So you see on the left hand side is the lobby and on the right hand side is the banquet facility. So the essential with the lobby is we have the staff offices adjacent to the lobby. And the idea is to have basically a gatekeeper. So you're going to drop off your kids at this facility. You want to make sure they're safe. So there's going to be somebody sitting at that desk at that window as they come in. And then they go to the different uh, activities. They want to make sure that they're just not going to run out the front door. So this is the one point of entry and exit. And then that way, the the building is secure and you're uh, ensured that you know your kids are going to be safe. Uh, the banquet facility is a very high end facility. Uh, we think, you know, with the detailing of the ceiling and the materials, uh, it would be a very nice place to have various functions, weddings. Uh, you know, different birthday parties, all kinds of different events, concerts, things like that. So um, it's a nice uh, space to have all kinds of events uh, in the city. This is the proposed site plan with, with different services. So what we wanted to make sure is um, that the service entrance would be separated from the main entrance of the building. So in the center, you see the, the normal drop off where the passengers would be dropped off. Um, and then off to the side, you have the garbage pickup, the generator, the catering drop off, all those things are separated from the, the public. So, so you, have, you, you don't have those uh, services crossing each other. Um, some of the design features, again, main lobby, that, that's you know, where you're coming in, the gathering space, banquet room, meeting rooms, all comes off the main lobby. You have the outdoor covered plaza in the front. Uh, we have this terrace in the back. Um, all functions are accessed from the main lobby. The second floor has secondary lobbies for gatherings. We have interior windows throughout the building uh, for light and vi uh, visual connection. Um, we have offices that are central for both on first floor and second floor for monitoring all the activities that are going on within the building. Um, the site is designed in a way that's uh, efficient uh, ingress and egress from the parking lot, uh, from the neighborhood into the parking lot. And then um, as far as the experience within the building, you have enhanced views um, throughout with large windows, ample natural light, and then uh, expanded space, integrating the building within the site. So we had a public meeting on June 29th, and there was a lot of discussion on that in that presentation as far as what people liked, what they would prefer. Um, one of the main takeaways was that um, people wanted to have a larger banquet facility. And so what happened was we took that into account. We had a uh, we proposed that and went to the commission. And at that time we had limited public participation. So the commission felt that, you know, it would be better to have a larger uh, public forum to make sure that that is in fact the way um, we should go um, because it's a large investment on the part of the city. So that's why we're here tonight to gather more input, make sure that is the direction uh, in fact that this, the community wants to see. So the capacity would go from 250 people as is now to up to 350 people. Um, here is the proposed design with the expanded uh, banquet hall. So, so the first floor would grow by 12 feet to the rear and the outdoor patio would move you know, at the same 12 feet. The, um, it's a thousand square foot increase at a cost of $450,000 and that would be up to 350 seat capacity. 
Um, the way the building is structured, um, that exterior wall is a bearing wall. So our recommendation is if you're going to grow the building on the first floor, um, we recommend that you grow it on the second floor as well, because otherwise you're gonna have columns coming down in that space and, and it defeats the, the purpose and the functionality of the space. So the second floor as well would grow with the same uh, amount and then uh, that would cost $450,000 as well. Um, when you have the larger banquet facility, um, it, we recommend to also increase the catering um, kitchen size as well as the storage size because you, now you're going to have more tables and chairs. You're going to have, you know, more food to serve. So as part of that expansion, we're recommending that the warming kitchen and the storage be added uh, to the facility, and that is a cost of one hundred and sixty-three thousand for um, three hundred and sixty-four square feet. So the total additional cost is one million and sixty three thousand for that expanded building footprint. Um, we looked at the uh, annual operation and maintenance cost. So you can see the extra square footage would add to about sixty six hundred dollars a year in, in additional cost. Um, city staff did some research and according to their research. Um, the city typically only has about two, 300 plus size events a year. Um, so that, that's, that's been the past. Now, you know, there's limited capacity in the city for that. So the question is, you know, is that moving forward? Or is that the past? And if you have, you know, if you build it, they'll come. So that, that's a different question. Um, once we get a direction here as far as um, a consensus. If we're gonna go with the original design, if we're gonna go with the Pioneer Grove, we're gonna expand the bit building footprint. Once we have that decision, we're gonna get started on the building design. And from, this, from that decision point, we anticipate the building will be completed in 660 days for occupancy. Um, and then if we expand the building, the, the schedule will be uh, expanded a little bit, but um, so that will grow by about 90 days. And uh, Priscilla will talk about the, the funding for the project. Thank you. So I, I know we've had a lot of interest in how much money was budgeted for the project. So I wanted to share this information with all of you. Um, the first uh, column that you see that says balances, this is the column that uh, was our estimate of what our services would cost. So we have a fee in here for administrative expense. That ex administrative expense is for us to have a construction project manager who's going to oversee the construction of this project, ensuring that the city keeps records of everything that's submitted, uh, shop drawings, requests for information. Um, this is a standard construction you know, industry protocols. Uh, we have somebody who keeps uh, records of everything that transpires on a project, takes photographs, has project meetings, and is documenting the, the whole process of our 660 day construction period. So this is the this was the proposed funding for the project, the balances here. Uh, that administrative expense is $490,000. Uh, we have an earmark for testing. Uh, this testing is earmarked at about $100,000. Uh, and this is during the course of construction for any owner um, owner inspections and testings that we need to do, or say we come across any unforeseen conditions that we need to test for. Uh, this is what this balance is, is allocated to. Uh, we have we had an architecture and uh, engineering expense, and this has already been expended. If you look at the next column, that's called encumbrances. This is what has already been spent and encumbered. And this was for the preparation of what we call the design criteria package. And that was when, we, when um, Walter Zachariah and Associates was discussing the RFP, uh, this was what told them what we wanted to build, how many square feet for banquet space, how many square feet for, for restrooms, et cetera. That was all in that design criteria package. And that's what that $85,000 was spent on. Um, there's also some funds here for relocation expenses. And this is for us to pay for any costs incurred by Parks and Recreation for relocating any of their equipment, furniture, 
um, anything that uh, needs to come out of the building that they need for continuity of services. Um, so that's available for us to use for parks and recreation. Um, we had estimated the total construction cost of this project to be about $9.5 million, uh, $9 million, a little a hair over that. Um, now the project came in slightly under at 9.1, but please bear in mind that at 9.1, that is just right now the price based on a lot of unknowns, things can occur during the course of, a, of construction, and we may need to increase the cost of construction for unforeseen circumstances. It's very standard in our industry. We come across something that we hadn't anticipated to be there. It wasn't in the actual design. We have to, you know, we, we have to um, respond to it. And so, you know, a contingency is a reality, and it's something that we need to keep, um, you know, uh, have some foresight for. Um, so this original budget of $10.4 million what ha was what had been earmarked from that 2018 revenue bond. Um, to date, we've encumbered the 9.2, and the 1.2 that's remaining and available are for these other expenses that the city still has that will take place during the course of construction. So I wanted everybody to be on the same page as far as what construction funds were available and, and what the balance in our budget is to date. And this appears to be the last slide. So I think uh, at this point, we'll start taking uh, public questions and comments. Um, I'm gonna walk around with the microphone. Um, and so please uh, just give me one second while I collect that and I'll come around to you. Commissioner, thank you again for this meeting. And I pray that now we have, I don't have to pray that I see many more from the last time we met. So that should be no excuse why we can't go forth with the Johnny L. Tigner Center. And to look at the capacity right now. And I know you said that it will seat 250. Now that's not what's on the design. The design said 208 with stage and without stage 224. We already short. When we look at it, I know it said we only have two events that have 300, maybe a plus. That ain't, that's not the total truth. And I don't know where the staff get that from, but that's not truth. And when we look at this city, we are 80,000 residents. It's 19,000 and about 500 plus in district two. That's only 1% right now of District 2. Are we not looking at the entire city? The Johnny L. Tigner Center is not about District 2. It's about this entire center. Just right across from the Johnny L. Tigner Center, just left. We're getting ready, city manager, to put 360 some apartments there. That's gonna give us an influx of another 1,500 to 2,000 folks. Oh, we're not looking at growth. Well, on the waterfront, we're getting ready to put 336 units there. Another 1,500 to 2,000 coming into our city. In District 2, is that not growth? Are we looking at city manager a vision for growth? Because that should show us that we need a bigger facility. We ought to be building something for 8,000 folks. You said concert. 
I ain't seen no concert come in with no 250 people. We couldn't put nothing there. That's a little unfair to the city. Let's think about it. Our entire city, 80,000 residents. By 20, 23, 24, we should be at about 90 some thousand if we keep building to a hundred. And the biggest park in our city, we gonna see 224 folks for an event. That's not a vision. The Bible says without a vision, the people perish. Don't let district two perish. So now, Mr. City Manager, commissioners, if we could look and see if there's some, cause the mayor talked about a million dollars, we would have to find, raise, get it from somewhere. Well, we need to be looking. Floating bond, is there one that could help us out? We need to be looking at grants. That's why we pay the grant writers. So they can be looking at all of this. So they can look and try to find some money. This is an educational building. It's just not a recreational building. Education is gonna be going on there, at least on the renderings, I see that. So we ought to be looking at money to come in for education. Then we ought to be looking at the CDBG. Here it go again, we have Stanley Terrace right there. That money is for undeserving areas, areas that cannot afford. We ought to be looking at that. A computer lab, a library. We ought to be looking at those funds to go there to help us out. Now we find money for every little dumb thing in this city. Let's find, let's find some money for the Johnny L. Tigner Center. That's going to help our entire community. This city, it will help. Let's wipe out district two. Because God knows. <laughs> If it came down to District 2, you sure enough don't want it to happen there for them. But let's just look at it. The whole city benefits from this. Right now, no convention can come in our, in our city unless it goes to the double tree. And they can only hold on table seating 350. Okay? No convention can come here. Why we are not looking to our future to bring to attract greatness in our city. This is the beginning of Broward County and the end of Broward County. Let's look at it. Please, please, let's write the vision and make it plain. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Daryl Adams, 1430 Southwest Fifth Terrace. And I like to say, Terry, that is very good observation. Um, you picked up on that. We need more space. I'm sorry. 224 um, seat, the seating in, inside the banquet room, that's not enough. We need more. And I heard, I went back on some of the Zoom meetings uh, on uh, YouTube. I'm sorry. And I heard a few commissioners say that it's only two or three. We don't want to spend a million plus dollars for two or three people in this community. Well, let me just say this. It's more than two or three people that want more seating at the Johnny L. Tigner Center. We want more seating. We want to compete with the double tree. If they have 350 seating uh, seats over there, why not compete with them and have the 350 seats at the Johnny L. Tigner Center? 
we want more seating. It's more than two or three people here that want more seating. We are speaking very passionately about seating. We don't want to go down to Pat Larkin Center. We don't want to take our money to Pompano. More seating here means more revenue for the city of Deerfield Beach. People will be more inclined to rent here as opposed to going down to Pompano. We want more seating here. We don't know how else to say it to you all. Please listen to the people. As Elijah Pat Larkins used to say in Pompano, if you want to know what the people want, listen to the people. This is what we want. We want more seating and 300 in, it was two events here with 300 people. You want to know why? You have to go to Pompano, to the Emma Lou Olson Civic Center. I worked in Pompano. I worked here. I retired from here. I set up events down in Pompano. I know. The dressing rooms, as I spoke about, we want the dressing rooms. We want the piano. We want the kitchen. We want everything that Pat Larkins got and more. This is a growing city. It's not going to get any smaller. Look into the future, please. We want more seating here at the Johnny L. Tigner Center, please. And thank you very much. Wayne Adams. Uh, I echo the sentiments of my, my brother and uh, Mr. Scott. Uh, I've been here all my life. I don't never remember the city putting $10 million in this community. I mean, maybe they did. Commissioner, you ever, you ever, you ever heard of it? I never heard of them putting 10 million. And I think now this is a perfect opportunity. Like Terry said, the city growing. Uh, all before we used to have to leave and go over. If we needed a, a big event, we always had to go to the chamber uh, of commerce. We want to stay right here. This is a great opportunity right here to showcase our city, to showcase a new building here. Like Terry said, we need to start looking for the future. This is not just District 2 or the Black Folks uh, Community Center over here, because I think sometimes that get lost. They go to looking at it where it's over there where the Black folks at, so we're not going to do nothing. This is, a, this is for this whole community here. I mean, everyone's going to come here and use it. You got the double tree. Uh, people will come right here if you, if you put the right facility, which from what I've seen on the rendition, uh, drawings, it looks beautiful. And I think the people will come here. And if you just look towards the future, I think we can get everything we want right here. And, and like I say, again, I don't never remember $10 million being put here. So, I mean, it's always like we have to come here and beg for any tangible that we want over here. It, it's always like we got to beg for everything over here, like almost get down on our knees and beg. Why? I mean, I see two, I don't know, two commissioners was here. I mean, it's like I always hear the mayor talking about two or three people. Whenever it's something over here, he hollers out, it's always two or three people complaining. Even when I work for the city and we wanted to try to get something uh, here or, or something that everyone was complaining about, it was always two or three people. I'm tired of hearing about two or three people. You got a whole community, got a pandemic, so people can't get out like they want to really express themselves. But quit looking at two or three people. I mean, you got to, you, you, it would probably be more people here tonight if it wasn't a pandemic. But let's just move forward and let's, uh, let's I support, you know, expanding the center. Thank you. Good evening. I'm part, not of District 2, but of our city. And all of our city needs the recreation center. And as you build it, 250 is okay for a very small event. But from the time I worked for the city and I retired from the city parks and recreation, we've never had the space where we could have large events where we could hold our repast from funerals, where we could hold our graduation and our, and our weddings. 
Um, so we need to do that for our residents, all of our residents. But we also need to think our city employees. They have always been limited in the number of, of programs that they put on for the city. And when we have the big citywide events, when we have the um, all the, the special days, the Black Heritage and all these, you had to go into a gymnasium, cover the floor, the lighting and the sound is not good, and you're very limited. We would be able to do all our city events there as well. And you're never gonna have the chance to do this again, maybe another 30, 50 years down the road. In the meantime, you do it while you can and you put in for all the people. And I know with these beautiful new uh, renderings of the rec facility that the rest of the residents are gonna come because they also want a place and they've come in the past, maybe not in droves, but they will come because they are part of our city. And I really urge you to do the expansion. I know it's gonna be rough, but you can find the money I'll help you find the money. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give some pay cuts to a few employees. How's that? Starting at the top. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> I'm Pastor Bowles, and it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm glad to be a part of what's happening. Uh, I, I agree with everyone here. I grew up in, in the city. And I agree for the increase. And, and, and we're talking supply and demand. There's a great demand. We need it. We need the extension. We need the room. The other thing that comes to mind is to strike the iron while it's hot. We're here talking about something that we can do now. I'd hate to be down the road five, 10 years, and we're sitting here crying about that we don't have enough room and space. And there will be increase. We know that. that there will be increase. Absolutely, it's gonna happen. Uh, the thing that will bother me the most is the fact that if we shortchange ourselves now and we have to look to do something later, costs are gonna go up. Costs are gonna be even greater to expand or do anything. And at that time, it's gonna be more difficult to go in and say, look, we need to tear this down or extend this. Costs are gonna go up. So while the iron is hot, the demand is great, the supply is somewhat available, but there's a little bit more we need to do. Let's let's put our shoulder to the plow, get it done, because the demand is there, it's needed. Let's get the supply, let's make it work, let's expand it. And the last thing I want to say is that District 2 is right in the middle, I-95. Everything gets all comes through District 2. Hey, let's make District 2 beautiful. Let's establish it, because it's not just for District 2. I think it's for the city of Deerfield. We're one, let's make it happen. And I think all of Deerfield will profit from it and be pleased with doing a great job right now. Let's strike the iron while it's hot. Thank you. Barry McMillan. The only thing I, um, the thing that's bothering me the most, I have to admit, is that it seems like you're building this from a local standpoint instead of a global standpoint. <laughs> we are, you, you talk about, um, the communities all coming together around the city and everything. Well, if we all come in together, then this building needs to be able to something for the city. So why aren't we building this from a global standpoint of the city of Deerfield, not District 2? And I do feel somehow the kids say some kind of way, because I feel like this is how you're building this building because it's in District 2. And if, I were, if you were to remove this building and put it somewhere else, I just feel like these meetings would be null and void and it would be 350 seats. It would be 350 seats. So now my question becomes is, if we're saying that we're a city that's coming together for the greater good of the city, not just district two, but district one, two, three, four, five, 10, 11, whatever, then we need 350. Like Mr. Scott said, the city is growing. Are we growing with it? Now you say you want us to grow, so are we going with it? So 200, 250 seats, and like he said, when you, and that was my, gonna be my question. So that 350, is that with the round tables or just, the, is that theater style or dinner style? No, that would be with tables and chairs. 
with tables. Okay. Yeah. So with tables and chairs. So then 350 and the revenue is going to come. There is a big hot, I mean, the demand for banquet facilities right now is just, uh, just off the charts and everything. You can, and like Daryl says, when you go to EPAD Larkin, you can barely get in because it's always such a demand. Well, now we have a place for that demand to basically absorb some of that revenue that's going to Pompano that can now come here or even Boca or surrounding cities. So that building is gonna take care of itself, but will you all allow us to let it take care of itself? The revenue is coming. You got to put a price on everything is being rented. And then, like I said, from a global standpoint, you're now talking about education programs that we can bring in there. Now you have organizations that's willing to come do their meetings there. Then you have a sense of tourism that may even come. Because now maybe you have places, this is a place where you can now be a small conference center. When you can do 350, you can do small conference centers. So it's going to take care of itself from a revenue standpoint. So again, I need the commissioners, stop thinking so small and locally and think globally for how you're building this building, okay? Just very, very quickly here. Um, I am going along with the majority on this 350 uh, is the bottom that we should be looking at for the size of a, a banquet facility. And I say that based on the fact that we don't even know as of yet what the numbers are from the census, how much we grew. I know we have left at 90,000. The, the county doesn't even have that. And just by way of a, a commercial for the, for the public here, the county will be looking at the redistricting numbers at, on September 30th at a meeting at Pat, Pat Larkin Center. And you all need to be there so that you can express what's going on. The last time they redistricted, remember they took us out of District 20 and put us uh, somewhere else. So we need to look at that. And if we have not, if we don't know what those numbers are in terms of how we grew by way of the census, then we need to take a step back and look at what we're doing here before we put this center together. Thank you. Are you gonna let me speak? <laughs> Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. Gwen Clark Reed, 1430 Southwest Six Way, Deerfield. Um, I've listened to the presented the present presentation at the commission meeting, and now I've seen the presentation again this evening. At the commission meeting, um, those two events that they are talking about, or they're talking about two city events. And that was very clear when the mayor said, uh, we only have two events uh, that have possibly that many people. But we aren't talking about city events. We're talking about the community at large. I don't think that, um, the, com the commission really understands how that center is used now and how it has been used in the past. We are at capacity and for some of the events that we wanna have. And the reason our events do not grow is because we do not have enough space for them to grow. Um, I know that alone, just the Little League football banquet has more than 300 people uh, attending that. And um, we, we also know that some of our repasses that we have within the community are over uh, that number, depending upon who the person is, well known to the city or other places. We also know that as I heard Jan Muntemeyer say about the setting up of the gymnasium for those two events that we do have. That is labor intensive. 
And it is true that, you know, it's a real burden on the staff to have be trying to get that gymnasium together to have these events. So uh, I'm speaking not to the developer, uh, the developers right now, I'm speaking to the commissioners, uh, Commissioner Hudak and Commissioner Drosky who are now hearing from more than the two people that were at the last meeting. When you hear someone in District 2 speaking, we aren't speaking just for ourselves. We have had communication with other members of the community, and unfortunately, they cannot be there this evening. So 350 people expansion, really, it should be 500. Um, if you really want to talk about the numbers that we can serve and the events that we can have and the events that we're not having because we do not have uh, those numbers. I wanted to ask the developers, um, this is an old building. And um, do you know if there's any asbestos in this building? Um, there was asbestos, asbestos testing done um, as part of the design criteria package. And my understanding is that there was no asbestos found in the existing building. Thank you. But I would just, again, just like to say to the commissioners to please, the million dollars that you're going to spend to have this expansion, the city will make it back twice and more if you do this because people will come and use this facility and it will be something that the city can really be proud of and uh just going to close it with that please expand that uh room to 350 people thank you i heard a saying once and it said this if you build it they will come so, um, you know, I want to thank everyone um, for your input um, tonight. Uh, just remember that um, uh, Chief Hofstein, Terry, and um, Priscilla is going to be available to answer any questions about their, you know, uh, department and the way that they're looking at things in Deerfield. Listen, as far as the building is concerned, this is the time for us to really, really look at being innovative. We have an opportunity here. We haven't put one shovel in the ground yet. This is the time to really think about it. This is the time to really do it. And it is true that it should carry some vision because Deerfield Beach will not be the same as far as its population is concerned. It will not be the same in 10 years as to what it is now. So we know that uh, projected growth actually may exceed, you know, wh 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 what we're thinking. And so it boils down to this, and let's stop talking about where it would be. Yes, it's in district two, but it boils down to a very fundamental question. And that fundamental question is, is it right for the city of Deerfield Beach or is it not? That's what it boils down to. And, and in my opinion, it is the right thing to do because um, it will provide opportunity. And we've heard from a lot of people um, uh, in, in, from the city of Deerfield Beach. We've heard from them all from different areas and, and different opinions. And so the people are speaking and, um, you know, we, we need to hear that. So I think that uh, if we're going to do anything, this is the time to really consider it. This is the time. We have the most opportunity now. And if we do the right thing, uh, the city actually, you know, uh, in whatever way we decide to go on this thing, actually could encompass projected growth by the decision to uh, to do this. It's It would encompass it. So it's something for us to think about. Is there an inconvenience? In terms of really looking for money, it is. It, there's a challenge. We can't overlook that. Listen, a million dollars is uh, a lot of money. But you know what? Um, the money that you come up with, whenever it's serving your community, you have done 
a good thing. And that's what we really want to do is serve the community. I mean, that's really where we should be. And to, go ahead. So um, are there any more questions about anything? Yes, yes, go ahead. Go, there. OK. That's something to help with revenue. You always have foundations or someone from the community who wants to make a large, um, you know, a large contribution to the city. And maybe some of those rooms need to be named after some some families that want to make and a, I think a million dollar contribution. You never know. Because that's why they don't shortchange people. You never know. But that's something that maybe should be offered or just really put out there. Well, it, the reason that it hasn't, because the, the city commission uh, would have to really vote that they want to enlarge that area. And then you start looking at whatever financial or monetary opportunities would be there, or uh, if in fact they would be there, but nothing has been done like that, no. And let me, I'd just like to add that there's a reason that there is a one year waiting list down at the EPAC Larkin Center because everybody wants to go there and rent that facility. There's a, almost a one year waiting. If you have an event today, if you want to book it again next year at the same time, you have to do it right away. That's what we want here. We want that same competition right here. We want to spend our money right here in Deerfield Beach. We want that center. We want the seating. You, you can see, you can set up for, uh, I know Pastor Pell, they go and they rent the facility and they have their church events there. All of these churches, the Delta Sigma Theta, the, the, the AKAs, they all have huge events there. We need the space to accommodate these people. We have a unique opportunity to do what's right right now. Let's do what's right. The time to do what's right is right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, May. Uh, what he say that there are two of favorites of banquets or whatever he said or whatever was put up there of 300 people we have had more events we use the um that place out there on the cold and the parking is horrible you don't have really because the parking lot is owned by the city it doesn't belong to that establishment but we've had over th i've gone to weddings there it's over 300 people because you use the top and the bottom you know and we go all the way out to State Road 84, the Signature Grand. So I don't know where they're getting the information from, but we do patronize, but we have not. When we have had the, folk, the um, Heritage Festival, we're sitting on top of each other, basically. With the pandemic, now we probably have to move, and we wouldn't be able to have about 10 people tables there because it, you go there and when the, there is no pandemic, we are right up on each other. You can't even move. So we do patronize and we do have these affairs, but we never had any place to go to do anything here. We have to take our money somewhere else. Also, when I'm thinking about the, the focal point, we're gonna pay more money at the focal point that's non-functional because all of our seniors go to Pompano, to EPAT Lockings. And I brought that to the commission before. Why do our people, our residents, have to go to EPAT Lockins to enjoy our seniors? And, and uh, Commissioner Hudet said, let them go. But it's not fair because we pay taxes. It, we are taxpayers. We are not beggars because a lot of us, we have been here a long time. And the ones that came after us. So for that to uh, say that to us, and then like the last time commissioner meeting, Terry and I went, that's when the two people came uh, about we just two people shows up. We have a pandemic and people are not coming out. We beg, we plead, we ask. And I'm thank God that we have the many people we have tonight. But we are doing the best we can with what we have to work with. And we only ask in the city to work with us. We give. 
Give back. Thank you. Anybody else? Commissioner, are you are you asking a question of still on this, Johnny L. Tigna? Well, basically, oh, 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 get ready to wrap it up. Okay, Commissioner, if I can just put something on record that we need to now look at more serious than ever before, and that's the graveyard, Pine View, and Memorial. You know, we are burying right now about five to six individuals a week. And right now they're pretty much all going over to Memorial. Memorial will soon be out of space. What are we looking at then to do? Because right now Pine View, they're only taking those that already have reservations. What happens when Memorial fills up and give it to next year? If we keep doing what we're doing, if this pandemic keep doing what it's doing, what are we gonna do in this city? There, there, there are um, a few initiatives, uh, Terry, that, uh, that is being looked at. First of all, a Memorial being one of them. And uh, there are other things that uh, that we're looking at as uh, and, and, and having some meetings that the city manager and I are looking to have with uh, uh, with some of the people from Fairway Memorial. There are some options that we looked at. We actually looked at the, the right across the street from where Pine View is. That area is not available. I thought it was, but it's not. Excuse me. That, that right. Well, he he has ideas about how to develop it, but that's a conversation for another time. You guys can come and and come to the city and talk about it. That if you like, I want to just kind of stay on this. Um, is there anybody else? I know we going on to something else, but I just want people to be aware that we have boxes in the Airwood area. I have a picture here. Uh, and I sent the picture to you, Commissioner, right. um, that we have talked to. So we have children getting up early in the morning, uh, going to school. And so we need to, I don't know how, how we're going to alert the community to this, but we, I have it here. Uh, one sitting up on somebody's fence, they sent the picture to me. So we have to alert this community because our children, they see uh, animal, they just, they, they don't know what it is. So we need to, I don't know how we're going to go about it alert the community, but we need to do something because I would hate for one of our children to get attacked by these things. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Yes. Yes. Do you see me on the screen? Do you see me? <laughs> I, I don't, but I hear you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Commissioner Preston, you know, we just want to remind the residents that of the budget workshop this Friday evening, uh, it's unfortunate that it is a Friday evening at uh, seven o'clock um, and they need to come out and express their views or concerns and understand what the new budget is encompassing. So uh, I just wanted to uh, bring that to the residents' attention that the budget hearing is on when on Friday and that the second, the final hearing will be the 13th uh, when the the commission will actually adopt the budget. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else? Uh, yes, go ahead. My concerns here are um, with you specifically, Commissioner, but uh, I'm concerned about the condition of Mayo Howard Park. Um, they did have a blitz or blast or whatever a couple of weeks ago, and they went in and they put some asphalt on top of asphalt and now it's bumpy asphalt. Um, we still have potholes. The bathrooms are never clean. I go to the beach every morning and I have to use the restroom before I go out and exercise on the field. The bathrooms have no soap, no toilet tissue. It's filthy when I go in there. And this has been, I take my own toilet tissue in there. That's, that's the way that bathroom is there. You have boys going into the women's restroom and smoking whatever they smoke. 
Um, they go in, they, they won't go into the men's restroom, which sometimes force the women that go out there to exercise to go into the men's restroom because it's so dirty. And I'm not sure who's responsible for cleaning them, but they're not cleaning the restrooms there. Um, in addition, uh, I'm concerned about the uh, traffic lights both at uh, Southwest 10th Street and 3rd Avenue and Hillsborough and 3rd Avenue, in that if you come out there at six o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning or what have you, no traffic's passing anyway. And those traffic lights do not change. Those traffic lights go through a certain pattern or what have you, and there should be something. If you're coming up to the light, the light does not change in your favor. It basically allows you to sit there through two uh, light changes yeah. before it will change. So I'm very concerned about that because if we're going out of our community and um, there's a lot of traffic going in and out of that community, the light should be more favorable. That, that um, light, uh, Mr. City Mayor, that's from the county, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, it's from okay. the county. We need to have that addressed to have them. Um, yeah, we can, we can take care of that. Okay. And then I'm on the beach, as I said, every morning and uh, I hear there's crossing audio for people that are crossing both Federal Highway and crossing at the beach. But our children cross at, um, at Hillsborough and Third Avenue, and there's no audio there for them. And I think that that's a travesty to have that, especially across, uh, across Federal Highway where you hardly have any children going across there, but our children cross uh, um, Hillsborough and Third Avenue going to school and back and forth or what have you, and we don't have any audio. I don't know who takes care of it, but I think we deserve to have our children protected just as much as the beach and, Hill, I'm sorry, and Federal Highway. And then I'm concerned also about code enforcement in our community because it doesn't look like it's working. So if, if there's something that can be done, whoever I can talk to or what have you, we, we do need to have code enforcement reinforced because they did, they started at one point and now they're not doing anything, it doesn't seem. Okay. Those well, are my concerns. Well, you can let me know specifically what your uh, give me a call, and uh, we can we can talk about specifically your your concerns, and we can go from there. Because I can tell you that uh, you may not see that, but there is a lot that code enforcement has been doing, and it is working. Uh, I've seen uh, uh, some massive changes in the in the, a lot of the communities. Uh, more the, the grass area uh, areas are looking better. So uh, there may be some things that need to be addressed, but let me tell you, uh, I've seen a, a huge difference in some of the things that, and not only the difference in, in uh, how the community look is actually how code attacks uh, that and how they uh, uh, are working with the, the residents in the community to help them to be able to do some uh, things that are better. So I'm, I'm really appreciative of that. Um, they've done a good job. And I'll tell you, um, I've had some concerns about different things. And anytime that I call uh, Mr. Power, he will take the time to explain things to me and, um, you know, just help me to be able to say what I need to say to the residents. And additionally, you know, how he might be able to solve the issue. A lot of the time he will take the calls and he will provide. So I, there's some, there's some very good things. So if you got something specific, let me know. And we'll, we'll, we'll definitely, but I also want to let you know about Mayor Howard Park. That has been a, a challenge uh, with me. And uh, uh, the blitz that you're talking about, if you had taken pictures prior to that, and uh, I brought this to the commission that that park needs attention. Okay. Uh, but prior to the blitz, it looked even worse. It, it, it looked even worse. And uh, yeah, under the leadership of Ms. Reynard, when she came, she did that and it looked really good. And, uh, yeah, and it, it, there, it, that part needs to be addressed. That's the bottom line. It needs to be addressed because all of the things that you mentioned, as far as the bathrooms, I've heard those complaints and I've also heard uh, the issues of, uh, you know, um, uh, of people, you know, like you say, possible drug use and, and that. And I, let me also tell you this, here's the other side of that, is that when, when those kinds of things have come to my attention, I have uh, relayed that information to BSO. And there are places um, just not too far away from here, actually, 
where there were things that were really tough with people selling drugs. Uh, I personally drove through some areas and I'm going to tell you when things, when people are not doing the right thing and they feel in control, they know whether you belong there or not. And I drive through and people would just be staring me down. And, uh, but BSO, um, you know, I will tell you, they have listened. They have been able to address some issues that were really, really tough. And those issues have gone away. Thank God. And I thank them for doing what they have done because the residents were calling me, you know, just, you know, almost every day of the things that were happening. And I've said, and I continue to say, I will not allow people to really threaten or to bully taxpaying residents. It's not going to happen. It shouldn't happen anywhere in Deerfield Beach. It shouldn't happen anywhere. But I can tell you this, it's not going to happen in District 2. It's just not going to happen. Uh, people that are trying to do the right things. Um, I, I have some pictures on my phone. You just would not believe uh, like one of the things that I saw the other night. One of the, my residents called me about loud music. So I left my house. I went out. And I'm not kidding. There were speakers <laughs> Uh, listen about I'm not kidding about as high as the screen and and and, and they it came all the way around and I, you know when when you hear loud music you hear you're thinking you're thinking you know small speakers and that sort of thing this was actually like a concert people windows rattling and that sort of thing and I'm gonna tell you um BSO was aggressive with it. They shut it down. Now, some of the times when, you know, BSO don't respond, it's not because they're just not responding. You know, one of the things that we have to understand is that life safety issues take precedent over, uh, over loud music. And so a lot of the times, uh, you know, if I've talked to someone in BSO, it is that they're on another call or whatever, but eventually they will come to wherever I have asked them to come. I've talked to uh, Chief Hofstein a lot. Uh, there's not been a single time where he's ignored me or uh, not tried to help the situation. And, uh, and um, we was able to resolve some issues, but I could not believe all of those speakers that would just, just set up no special uh, events permit, nothing, just set up and go to work. Uh, but that's not going to be tolerated. So we're going to do what we need to do. But I'm also tell you this, uh, when you have a situation that you are not comfortable with, it is your responsibility to come to the commission meeting and share the information with the commission um, to let them know, put the pressure uh, on people that are willing to serve you. Now, I sit up there with four other people and I will tell you, um, they are concerned. It's my feeling that they, they are concerned about this city. It doesn't mean that we agree on anything, everything we debate and we debate hard and that's fine. But, you know, they are there to serve everybody in the city as I am here to serve everybody in the city, no matter what district, so are they. So if you've got a challenge about something, I invite you to come to the city commission meeting and share whatever concerns that you have. And also I want you to be optimistic about how things may be resolved. Our city manager is a public servant. I'm a public servant. Everybody up here, Chief Hostin is a public servant. We are here to serve you because it's your taxpaying dollars that allow us to be in that position. And so I challenge anybody uh, to not care about your concerns, to not do something about it. That's what we're there for. And uh, I gotta tell you, I'm encouraged that things can be resolved uh, and information can be shared with the idea of bringing about a result, changing it. If it's not good, change it. So there's a lot of good things that are happening. But like I said, if you don't have a, if, if there's an issue, please come to the commission meeting and share your concern. You got, you got something else? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'd like to welcome Chief Hopstein to his position, his new position. And let, to let you know that I feel really safe where I live. I don't have any problems where I live, but um, one of the things that is always a concern for me is um, having officers be more friendly to the community. Correct. And um, that's still a concern. 
So if we could have our officers that serve our community be more friendly in our community, I would appreciate it. I'm not sure what everybody else's um, thoughts are, but I would appreciate that. Chief, thank Austin, you for sharing that. What, 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 Why don't you say a few words? Just if I may. Thank you, folks. Uh, first of all, I'm blessed uh, and privileged to be serving as your next police chief. Um, I love this city. I love this community, and I love to serve it. And so does my police department, and we're going to continue to do that. Uh, I'm so glad you mentioned that, that you feel safe. And it's important to talk about, of course, safety is paramount. It's a cornerstone of public safety, but it's only one part. Um, I take a very holistic approach to law enforcement. Um, there's two components that are not mutually exclusive and they are public service and they are community. And the two, that DNA is interwoven. Um, it's, it's a partnership. Everybody in this room, what I've heard tonight is the theme of partnership. We all are partners, our partners from the hospital, our partners from the church, our partners from the community. Um, I'm new as your police chief, but you know I'm not new to this community. Um, I've been here going on seven years. I've been proud to serve for the last two as your executive officer. And I'm proud of the relationships I've developed with the very people in this room. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate that you're here. Um, this is what it's all about. You folks are so passionate and I love it. Uh, I work with Mr. Scott. I work with the Adams brothers. I work with everybody here who cares about your community. And I hope what I've conveyed to you over the last two years, and I'm gonna to continue to do so as long as I have the honor of serving as your police chief is how much I care about it. And I'm your partner in that. Everyone is a partner here, the city, Mr. Commissioner, Mr. City Manager, everybody here is what I call, we're all nodes in this mesh. And it takes us to make a difference, to make your community safe, to keep it safe. And I wanna circle back to yes, that outreach is so important. I want every deputy and they will, to the best of my ability, emulate my passion and love for this city. And I, I want them to not be afraid to reach out and I want them to want to reach out. And you're gonna see a lot of outreach that I can tell you even more. You know, we got a little sidetracked by this pandemic, uh, which is just crazy and sad for all of us. We've all been touched. I'm very happy to see all of you here, by the way, healthy and safe, um, but we gotta get back to business. And I'm so happy for our medical partners that are making us healthy and we have vaccines because we need to get back in the community. So I look forward to doing that. Um, we have a lot to do together. Thank you, folks. I, I just want to just tell you, uh, um, not too far away from you, and you said you feel safe in your neighborhood. Now, that, that's important. I, I actually, I'm, I'm glad you said it, but in a way, you shouldn't, it, it just should be automatic. It just should be what it is. But not too far away from you were some huge challenges, huge challenges. And let me tell you, uh, there were people calling me with people that actually was blocked in their own driveway. They were blocked in, could not leave their own house. And the, and the guys that were doing it basically dared the police to do it. That's not the way that it is right now. I haven't heard from anyone in that area in months because, because and you know what I'm talking about. Yes, you do. And, uh, and the reason that it is is because I was talking um, to Chief Hopstein and Chief Brimlow about the problems, and I let them know, but they shared my feeling. It, it's just not going to happen. Law-abiding citizens are not going to be bullied and tolerated by these thugs. This ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. So we will do what that needs to be done so people can walk on the streets and and just uh, you just just do what they need to do and, and feel free in doing so. Um, and that's the only way that it should be. So you have the commitment, you know, of this city. And I will tell you, there have been other areas in the city where there have been uh, problems, but I will tell you, I'm passionate about it. But I tell you what, if you were to go to a city commission meeting and challenge any 
other than myself, any one of the other commissioners about what's not happening in terms of safety, I will guarantee you they will be just as passionate. I guarantee it because I've seen it. I've watched them. So it's a matter of us, all of us, doing what we need to do to ensure safety for every citizen in Deerfield Beach. That's our job. That's our job. If your citizens don't feel safe, what kind of city do you have? Who's going to move here? I tell you what, there won't be anybody uh, wanting to, to come over to the uh, Johnny L. Tigner Center. You can drop it down to 50. Nobody going to come. Okay, but on the other hand, if you do what you need to do, you know what, uh, like Ms. Clark Ree said, you know, maybe 350 won't be enough. Maybe we need to go up because they will come. Um, I have one final thing to say. Um, and it's really a question. Um, Deputy Harold Morrison, he was an outstanding guy, stand up law enforcement officer. This guy, he was very friendly. We all know him. We we all know him. He passed away. Will there be a road, a street, or something near Johnny Tigner named after this guy? Because he is well deserving of that. Um, let me just answer that. The, 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 when it was first brought to the commission that he had passed away, um, I brought that forward, that the street be named Deputy um, H. Morrison Street. The, the commission adopted it. it. It just wasn't a thing of what he meant to me. The entire commission talked about a great man and a great servant. So that's already done. It's already done. Okay. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much.